Yep. Um, okay. <clears throat> so we'll talk about today's day, which is Pesach Sheini. I'll go a little bit into the origin of this day, the, the source for it in Torah, and what we can learn from it. So the sheets that I gave out, if anyone has a Chumash in front of them, they could find it in Chumash Bamidbar, and it's chapter test nine, Pasuk Dalad. So the, this day is a day that's actually written in the Chumash, that it's a Yantif, and this is the source. I'm gonna go through, well, let's go through together reading the Sukkim. Vaydaba Meisho Bnei Yisro Lasis HaPasach, Moshe Rabbeinu spoke to the Jewish people, told them to perform the Pesach offering. When was it? They did the Pesach offering in the first month. It was on the 14th day of the month. It was to be done in the afternoon in the Sinai desert. So this is not when they went out of Egypt. This was the following year. When they went out of Egypt, they had the Paschal sacrifice in Egypt. So this is as they're traveling in the desert. And that month came around again, the month of Nisan. So they were told on the 14th of Nisan to bring the carbon Pesach and to celebrate the holiday of Pesach. Then the next page, Six, above. There were people that were impure. And the reason why they became impure is because they were in contact with a dead body. And therefore, they couldn't bring the Pesach offering on that day. And the reason is because one of the conditions in bringing the sacrifice in the Besamikdash is that the person has to be impure. And if he's impure, he's not allowed to bring the sacrifice. He's not allowed to enter the Besamikdash. So they couldn't do it. So these people came to Moshe and they filed a complaint. First of all, who are these people, by the way? There are two opinions. One opinion says they weren't ordinary people. These were people that Moshe Rabbeinu appointed them to carry the body of Yosef from its right. We know that Yosef was buried in Egypt, but he requested that when the time comes that the Yidden will leave Egypt, they should carry his body and bury him in Israel in the city of Shechem. To this day, we have the spot in the city of Shechem, which is the burial place of Yosef. So they were in the desert for 40 years. There were people that were designated to be in charge of his body. So as a result of that, they were impure. That's one opinion. There's another opinion. We just learned in the Parsha that when they built the Mishkan, the sanctuary, it was on the first day that they started, there was a terrible tragedy. And the tragedy was that the two sons of Aaron died. And Moshe turned to a few people and said to them, they should carry out the body and we'll have to continue this service, the Aveda in the Mishkan. So the other thing is said, these are the people that were taking care of the body of our own sons. So either way, these were people who were probably prominent people that were chosen for this kind of, um, you know, Aveda to do something like this. 
And now they came to Moshe with a complaint. And these people said to Moshe, we are impure because we came in contact with the dead body. And they said these two words, which became very famous words, why should we be excluded? All the Jewish people, the whole Jewish nation is involved together in this sacrifice. Everyone brings a sacrifice and we alone are going to be excluded. The guilty hakriv is carbon Hashem, that we won't be able to bring Hashem, the offering to Hashem, the Maida in its proper time, the same for Israel, together with all the other Jews. What it was hurting to them was here's a mitzvah that was given to all the Jews. All the Jews are going to be part of it. And we, because we were in contact with the dead body, we're going to be excluded. But Yei Malei Page 117. So Moshe came to them and he said, and Moshe answered them, Indu, stand, and I will let you know what Hashem says. In other words, Moshe Rabbeinu heard their complaint, accepted, and they have the right to make this request. And let me speak to Hashem and see what Hashem says. And then Hashem spoke to Moshe and said the following, Dabra B'nai Yisrael, speak to the Jewish people and tell them, I'm giving you a new, a new portion in Torah with a new halacha. Ish, ish, kiyir, tome the nefesh. If it ever happens to any person that they'll be impure because they came in contact with a dead body, either for that reason or maybe they're on a road, maybe they're traveling, and they're so far away from the base of English or from the sanctuary that they can't bring a sacrifice. Lachem, or the Derisechem. This applies to you, the people that were present at the time, or all future generations. Vasa Pesach Lashem. They shall perform the Pesach offering to Hashem. How will they do it if they're impure or they're very far away? In the second month, Nisan is the first month, and the second month is the month we're in now called Ir. But as you know that in the Chumash, the months don't have names. The months are identified by numbers. And the first of all the months is Nisan, and after that, every month is <clears throat> goes by the first. So Ir is the second. In fact, Tishrei, when we have Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of the year, is actually referred to as the seventh month, so in the second month, on the 14th day, when do we bring the sacrifice on Pesach? On the 14th day. Pesach itself is on the 15th. But the sacrifice is brought on the 14th. So on the 14th of the second month, you'll perform this mitzvah that you missed out. And eat it with matzah, and eat it with bitter. That's how you should eat it, just like the original sacrifice was supposed to be eaten. Do not leave over any of it until the morning, which is one of the laws that apply to the original sacrifice. Another halacha that applies to the original sacrifice is you're not allowed to break any of the bones. In fact, you should follow all the laws that apply to the Pesach offering that's done originally should also be done in the second month to Pesach Sheni. So, but if a person is pure, there's nothing really that's preventing him from bringing the sacrifice. Or he's not on the road. But he just won't bring the sacrifice intentionally because he's rebelling against Hashem. So it's a very serious violation. That person will be cut off from his people because he did not bring the sacrifice in his proper time. He has to bear his own sin and he has to suffer the consequences. What does it mean to be cut off? So it means that the person wouldn't, wouldn't be put to death by Bezdin, but that he wouldn't be able to live more than, I guess, till the age of 60. So this is the story in the Chumash. Now today, naturally, we don't have a base of English and we don't bring sacrifices. So practically we don't follow this. What do we follow? 
we follow a custom. This is not an obligation, but it's a custom to eat matzah today. Because then with the sacrifice, they ate matzah. And the other custom is, the other thing which we follow is in davening, we don't say tachlun. Tachlun is a part of davening, which is the confession. And we don't say that whenever there's a holiday. So today is considered a holiday, a small holiday, a minor holiday, but of course that we don't say tachlun. Wait, right? What? They ate matzah together with the sacrifice, like the carbon pesa. They were supposed to eat it with the matzah. Kohanim? Not the Kohanim, every Jew. Every Jew. The, the custom today is that you eat matzah sometime during the day because it's in the afternoon, like they did it in those days. There are some, you don't have to do that, it's just some people go ahead and eat matzah again at night. The reason why there are these two opinions is because the sacrifice was brought by day and we're supposed to commemorate the sacrifice. But they ate the sacrifice at night. So therefore some say we should also eat at night. But the general custom that sort of more or less most people follow is to eat the matzah today by day, which means you would wash and eat matzah to, com to commemorate Pesach Shein. Now, there's a lot of things we can learn from this. Before I go to, into what we can learn, let's look at another story in the Torah that's similar to this. It's the only other story that's similar to this. And that is, if you turn the page, and this is another Chumash, this is Chumash, um, not another Chumash, I mean, it's another Parsha, Parsha's Pinchas. So if anybody doesn't have the sheets in front of you, but you have a Chumash, you can look it up in Chumash Bamidbar, Parsha Pinchas, chapter 27, and first Pasuk. It says like this, Ve'elishmeiz b'neisav, this is, these are the names of the daughter of someone whose name was Tzlovcha, they had five daughters. The names were Machla, Noah, Chagla, Milka, and Sirza. He passed away, their father passed away. And when a father passes away, then the children inherit what he owns, inherit the land that he owns. So and at that point, they understood that the laws of inheritance apply to the men, not to the women. So these women, came before Moshe. This was the first women's movement, as you realize. But they stood in front of Moshe and in front of Lazar the Kohen, let's turn the page, and in front of the heads of all the tribes and basically in front of the entire community. And they presented their case. And they said, our father died in the wilderness. He was not amongst that group that they revolted against Hashem. As we know, there was a person whose name was Korach, and he and a group of people rebelled against Hashem, and miraculously, uh, the earth opened up, and they were swallowed up by the earth. So they're saying he was not a troublemaker, he was not part of that group. He died, but not because he was a rebel. And he died because of his own sin. He did something personal. He was not one of those people that involved the whole community to, to rebel against Hashem. And now that he passed away, we are told that we can't inherit the land. And they're saying almost the same words, Why should the name of our father be worse than other people that his land will not be inherited because he only has daughters. He has no son. We're asking, respectfully, sort of demanding, give us a possession of that land that belongs to our father, just like his brothers can inherit. We should be able to inherit. So Moshe thought that they had a good argument. Moshe brought their case before Hashem. And Hashem said, the daughters of Slavchad, what they say, is really just their right. And therefore you should give them a portion of the land and their father's land will be transferred to them. And then comes the whole part of the Chumash about the future that if a man passes away, how his daughter could inherit him 
uh, together with the men. So these are two stories that are very similar and very similar in a very strong way. And that is that there was in both places, I'm not going into it, but both places, if you look in Rashi, the commentary here, Rashi will say that Hashem already prepared this mitzvah before. It wasn't that he just created a new thing. It was already prepared. But for whatever reason, Hashem didn't give the Jewish people the mitzvah of Pesach Sheini. And again, this law that women could inherit was already prepared in the Torah. And in heaven, it was all set and ready to go. But for some reason, Hashem did not give it over to Moshe to teach the Jewish people. When they came and they asked for it, that's when Hashem said, now I'm giving it to you. Which means clearly that everything else in the Torah, Hashem gave it to us on his own initiative. And these two things, for whatever reason known to Hashem, Hashem said, I have it, it's all set, I'm ready to give it to you, but I'm going to wait for you to ask for it. And when you ask for it, that's when you'll get it. So one of the things that we learn from this is that there are certain things that Hashem gives it to us on his own initiative. And there are certain things that could be all set, all ready to go, but Hashem, reasons known to him, waits for us to ask. And once we ask, then Hashem comes through and gives us whatever it is that we're asking. And that's what happened here with these two stories. So one of the things that we learn from this, and I'll elaborate on this a little bit more later, is that we're living in a time now, and this is what the Rebbe said regarding the subject of Mashiach, that now we deserve Mashiach. We are worthy of Mashiach. After everything we went through and everything we've done, where are we up to? What's the update? The update did, we're all set and all ready, but now Hashem is waiting to hear from us that we want Mashiach. Just like here, they were saying, I don't want to be left out. I want to have the holiday of Pesach like everybody else. Or the women that said, we don't want to be left out. We want to have a share in the land like everybody else. When people come along and they say, this is what we want and it's precious to me and dear to me, then Hashem says, okay, on that basis, I'm giving it to you. And that's what happened. So this was the basis, and especially in the 1980s that I was spoke a lot about that us, that we need to express to Hashem that we want Mashiach. We have to daven for Mashiach. And not only daven, but actually that's when the Rebbe introduced the song, we want Mashiach now in every way possible, whenever people get together, if it's at a wedding, if it's at a bar mitzvah, if it's at a dinner, it's at a party, somehow, somewhere, someplace to express that we want Mashiach. And when Hashem sees that as the Jewish people want Mashiach with all their heart and soul, then even though we're all ready, but he's waiting to hear from us how much we want it, and then he will give it to us. What I want to go into now is another thing, and that is, I'll give out the sheet, but if you have the book Hayom Yom, then you all have it there. If you don't mind, Miriam, just to pass this around. Thank you. In the Hayom Yom of today, it says, what is the theme of this day, Pesach Sheni? One side is Yiddish, the original, the other side is the English. The theme of Pesach Sheni is, it's never too late. It is always possible to put things right. So even someone who was tummy, which means ritually impure, or someone who was far away, and even if it was lachem, lachem means even if it was intentional, he intentionally did things to disqualify himself from bringing a sacrifice. The Torah says you have another chance and you can make up for it. And that is that the next month when this day comes around, you can do this mitzvah. So this is a very powerful lesson in terms of letting us know that it's not too late and there's never anything that's really lost. We can always make up for it. What is this referring to? Where do we apply this? We apply this to the concept of tshuva. Basically, not everybody's perfect. And there's things we missed out. I didn't do this mitzvah. I didn't do that mitzvah. I didn't do it on time. And some things are commandments, things that I shouldn't do. And I violated and I did do it. 
So I would think, okay, it's over. Shabbos is over, or Yontem is over, or Shoshan is over. There's nothing I can do about it. In this case, Pesach is over. What could you do? And here the Torah tells us something amazing happened. Hashem said, the date is gone. It's 30 days later, and yet you could make up for what happened 30 days ago. I want to explain this a little bit better. There's a lot of things in Torah. In fact, almost everything in Torah is connected to time to dates. Shabbos is the seventh day of the week. Rosh Hashanah is this day of the first month. Yom Kippur is the 10th day of the month. Everything is at, at certain days. So what if I missed out to do what I need to do on that day? Can I make up for it? So if I, make, if I don't keep Shabbos, can I take Sunday and do everything right on Sunday? The answer is no. Why not? There are a lot of things if I missed out, Forgive, for example, if I didn't eat for a day, so I can catch up tomorrow, eat, make up what I missed out the day before. If I didn't get enough sleep, the next day I can sleep a little bit extra, make up for my loss of sleep. Why wouldn't it be such a thing spiritually also? If I missed out something, the next day, a man didn't put on film on Monday. Okay, so on Tuesday, I'll put on film two times. Put it on, take it off, put it on again. One for Tuesday and one for Monday. Doesn't work like that. By the way, there's some things in Torah that do work like that. Let's say a person uh, sets aside that he's giving, he gives luck every day and he missed a certain day to give it stuck. So the next day you give twice as much. You give the amount that you would have given yesterday. So you can make up for it. Learning, you know, you're supposed to be learning every day. That's true. But imagine if a person missed and, he, and he's behind in what he's supposed to be learning. So the next day you catch up, you learn extra time and you catch up what you missed. But most things, if you miss the time, you can't make it up. Why not? What's the sort of spiritual reason behind it? So the reason behind it is, the deeper reason behind it is that the whole purpose of mitzvahs is to bring godliness into the world and to refine ourselves. So if I do a mitzvah, it brings refinement into me, my home, and my environment, because every mitzvah we do, we draw it down in godly light. And that godly light elevates and transforms the person, the body, the soul, etc. But there's also another thing. And that is that time was created by Hashem. He created time. He created Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, a cycle of seven days. And therefore, when we do a mitzvah at a certain time, not only does it affect me, not only does it affect my home and affect my environment, it also brings godliness into this realm of time, into this day. That this Shabbos, by me doing the mitzvahs I was supposed to do and not violating Shabbos, I brought holiness into this day. And same with, with tefillin. When I put on tefillin on Monday, I put on the tefillin that brings refinement into my body, into my soul, into my home, into the shul where I'm davening. But there's another thing. The day, which is Monday, like today, the 14th day of the year, this day has now been elevated and transformed because I did a mitzvah. So if I missed out doing the mitzvah and I want to do it tomorrow twice, I can't. Why? Because it's true, I'll put on film twice, but Monday is gone. And I can't help it anymore. Monday is gone, and the Monday had no film, so it's over. If a person is supposed to hear the show from Rosh Hashanah, and they missed it, so why can't they hear the show for twice the day after Rosh Hashanah? Or three days after Rosh Hashanah? I'll blow show for 10 times and make up for it. The answer is no, this is something that needs to be done. I mean, one answer, there's many answers to this. This is something that needs to be done on Rosh Hashanah. Because by doing it on that day, I'm also elevating the day. In a sense, it's like saying, imagine if somebody is hungry and hasn't eaten, and you say, okay, I missed out giving this hungry person food, I'll give someone else food. That doesn't help this hungry person, he's still gonna be hungry. Giving someone else food is not, it's a different person. This person didn't get what he needed for his survival. And unfortunately, damage was done by him not getting his food or whatever it is that he needed physically. So what we're saying is the day itself is part of the process. 
I'm elevating the day. Every day is like is, is a creation of Hashem. And by doing a mitzvah on that day, the day is being elevated. The Shabbos day, the Sunday, the Monday, the Tuesday, that day in the month, and that day in the month never comes around again. So therefore, when it came to Pesach, it seemed to be inconceivable. How could you make it up? Pesach was gone. It's over. There's nothing I can do. Comes along, Moshe Rabbeinu said, Hashem said, there's something really out of the ordinary is going to happen. You can bring a sacrifice on a different day, and as far as Hashem is concerned, it'll have the effect, and it's as if you brought the sacrifice at the right time. It's as if you would say, okay, I'm giving you a time machine. You can go back to the day that you missed, and do the mitzvah. Or maybe give the day a time machine that the day could come to the future and you can do the mitzvah. Basically, this is something which I would think is inconceivable and it's, it's unacceptable that is a way of correcting it. And yet the Torah tells us that, yes, you could correct it. So what we're saying here, the Shtokim found is it's never too late and it's never lost means that when a person stops and thinks about their lives and thinks about things that they missed out and they didn't do, and it looks like it's, this is lost forever, it's for eternity, it's not true. Tshuva not only helps me from this point and on, Tshuva has the power to turn around the past. And, and, uh, and that's what it means, that it's never too late, and that's a very powerful thing, that I can look back at the past if I do my Avedah properly, and Hashem will consider it as if I did that. I mean, there are, there are uh, stories in Gemara. There's one particular story about a certain individual. Of course, that's, that's uh, also an exception, but he, his name was Rabbi Lazar ben Durdaya. And he was a man that committed a lot of sin. I think the Gemara says, the words are that there wasn't a sin that he didn't commit. He did everything. And then something happened. And because of that something, he was suddenly aroused to do tshuva. But he couldn't get himself to do tshuva properly. And I think he heard a heavenly voice that said that you can't, your tshuva will not be accepted. And he was crying. And he called out to Hashem near the mountains. And he heard a voice come from the mountains saying, no, there's nothing we can do for you. The same as with the river and the same as with the valley. He kept hearing voices from above that there's nothing they can do for him. And he was so broken that he can't do the proper tshuva. He put his head be between his knees and was crying until he passed out. When he passed out, it said that the heavenly voice came out and said that this person, and his name changed to Reb, Rabbi Elazar ben Dordaya, that he has his share in the world to come, as if he did mitzvahs his whole lifetime. So that means here's a person that didn't live a life of mitzvah, just the last moment before he passed away, he did a complete tshuva. Nevertheless, Hashem gave him all the rewards and he was able to accomplish spiritually as if he lived a full life of Torah and mitzvahs. And that's the power of tshuva. So that means that we don't look back and say, whatever happened is gone, it's over. There's no way I can correct it. This, Torah, this part of the Torah teaches us that it's something that we can do and make up for whatever it is that was that was lost. I have a question. Yeah. Um, a couple of weeks ago, someone in the door mentioned to me that there was a whole concept that um, the aver of eating treif is actually irreversible and it affects your neshama permanently even if you do to sugar beet kosher. So what's the truth to that? And is there a second chance to it like a woman now? Um, let me try. It, it probably needs more time, but I'll, let me just explain a little bit. The basis for that is from Tanya. And the Rebbe says in Tanya that eating not kosher is different than other things because it's something physical. And the not kosher food, which is connected to Klippa, actually goes into my body and becomes part of my flesh and blood. And how could that be reversible? It's there. It's factual. So I'll tell you what the Alter Rebbe says, and then I'll tell you how it applies to us. The Alter Rebbe says the following, that generally speaking, it will not be elevated until Mashiach comes, and then it will be. 
But there is one possibility that it could be elevated even now. And preparing you in advance is such a possibility that you'll say, oh, forget it. Uh, I'll never get to that level. But this is what he explains. He explains that when a person does something which makes them distant from Hashem, and they want to do tshuva to become close to Hashem, there is a possibility, specifically and precisely because they were distant, that this could generate such a strong emotion, such a strong feeling, and such a strong desire and craving to be connected to Hashem, that it would be impossible to experience that if not for the fact that I did something which made me distant. So generally speaking, it's a feeling of love for Hashem that I would never, no matter how hard I would huff and puff, I would never be able to develop such a strong level of love for Hashem. But because I was far, and because I was away from it, that in itself will bring me to feel such appreciation, such love for Hashem in getting close to Him that I never would have been able to have. If a person experiences that, that everything I did before, which was a sin, and even the non-kosher food that I ate, it all becomes transformed into Kedusha. Why? Because this became the catalyst for me to reach this higher level of love for Hashem. I mean, just to explain this in some sort of a simple way, in general, if there's something which you always had and you appreciate it, your appreciation is limited in a certain way. But if it's something which you didn't have or God forbid lost it, and then you get it back. For example, there was a woman here in the neighborhood many years ago that she had lost her eyesight and she became blind for 14 years. And through a whole sequence of events, someone suggested to go certain doctor, the surgery. He did surgery on her eyes. And after 14 years of being blind, she began to see. The first reaction was that when she saw herself in the mirror, she thought she was looking at her mother. Because she remembers herself younger in black hair. And here she sees herself in gray hair and she looked like her mother. She was lecturing and talking. But I want to talk about one aspect she appreciated the fact that she had vision, right? Is it possible for a person who, thank God, was blessed with healthy vision their whole life to experience the same appreciation that she had? No. Impossible. No one asked for it, no one was looking for it. But once it happens, one thing we know for sure that the appreciation of having the ability to see, and the same as with any other, God forbid, thing that might happen, that appreciation comes only as a result of the fact that I was lacking it before. And the same is spiritually, that it's possible for a person to reach a level of love Hashem because they didn't have it. And therefore, as a result of that, all the things that I did before is transformed into Kedusha. So the question is, okay, so you're telling me I have to reach this level of love Hashem that I'm going to go crashing through the roof. I mean, who's on such a level? So... Uh, let me share with you something that uh, the Rebbe answered people. People wrote this to the Rebbe, this question. When they learned Tanya, they were sort of very upset. They wrote the Rebbe. And I'll tell you what the Rebbe answered and how most people understand this answer. In fact, I personally spoke to people who wrote this to the Rebbe and got this answer. What did the Rebbe write? When they wrote about the fact that they feel so much remorse that they ate tray or about relationships that they had before, they didn't keep the laws of family purity, the Rebbe's answer was, that they should try to inspire other Jews to keep kosher, try to inspire other Jews to keep family purity or other things. And in that way, um, I don't know if they ever concluded, that's what they should do. On the surface, it sounds like, okay, being that you're missing something, do something extra, try to inspire others. But I think, and especially based on other things that the Rebbe writes, I think what the Rebbe is saying is that in this way, you can accomplish what in the olden day they needed this super, super level of love to accomplish. What's the principle here? The principle is if I committed a sin and that sin leads me to love Hashem more then the sin becomes transformed into a positive, like a mitzvah, because it led me to have a greater level of love for Hashem. So if a person's negative experience leads to actually promote and generate more godliness in the world, it becomes positive. So give me an example. There's a famous scientist uh, that came out of Russia. He was very, very famous and a big speaker. 
And unfortunately, he's not well today. Hashem should send him a complete refuah. Mm -hmm. But in his heyday, he was, he wrote books, he spoke, and he was a brilliant scientist. Many years, they wouldn't even allow him to leave. He was an atheist before he became religious. And, and when he spoke to scientists, he spoke to them in their language, spoke to them about his experience before, how he didn't believe in God. And when he spoke, they were inspired. And I guarantee you, much more than me, if I would come and say, well, I believe in God, I think that's the right thing. Like, but if someone that talks to them, that had the same background as them, the same experience as them, had the same beliefs as them, and then describes them how he came from there to recognize Hashem, and through science came to recognize the greatness of Hashem, and how he, his life was inspired to love Hashem, this inspired them more than anything else, which means that the reason why he was able to inspire them was only because he was an atheist, only because he didn't do all those things. So now those things become transformed into a mitzvah. I was once talking to someone who was uh, before not religious, but then became religious. We were talking about, I guess we were talking about bagels. And he says to me, you don't even know what a real bagel tastes like. Mm -hmm. Rabbi, you eat bagels and I keep snailing it. These are not bagels. I tasted real bagels. And he was talking about, you know, the difference between the non kosher food that he ate. But it's more than that. When someone like that will talk to somebody about keeping kosher, and they would say, yeah, but if I keep kosher, I won't be able to eat this or that or have, or have, um, have this kind of food or that kind of food. Yeah, but when you hear it from someone who was in the same place as you and enjoyed the same thing as you, and then he made the transition and that encourages you to do the same. So specifically because he ate the nut kosher, that now becomes a catalyst to inspire one, two, or sometimes hundreds of people to keep kosher and to move forward in their Yiddish life. So that's a way that today, without reaching that higher level of like super love for Hashem, just by inspiring another person based on my experience could turn my experience into a mitzvah. That's the point. Any questions? Any follow what I'm saying? Yes, is, it, is it only today that you can do that? Yeah, because years ago, it wasn't so um, common that someone who was keeping Torah Mitzvah could walk over to someone who wasn't and inspire them to change their lives. It was very, very unusual for that to happen. Is it only Pesach Shani that you can do? Oh, this halacha is Pesach Shani, yeah. So practically and physically, we do it in Pesach Shani. But spiritually and figuratively, we can do it with all the mitzvahs. This is teaching us a lesson about everything in Yiddish Christ. But you're not doing this tshuva on Pesach Shein? Pesach Shein, no. This tshuva, it's like everything else. The day in the year that empowers us to do it is Pesach Shein. And by us observing Pesach Shein, whichever way we're observing it, by eating matzah, that's how we absorb this energy that this day gives us. And then I can use this energy for the next 350 something days of the year, and next year, Pesach Shani, we get a, we we um, get another shot, another booster shot. Um, yeah. Because it is a yanta, it's still a yanta. The day is a yanta. We can't practice certain things because we don't have a base of English. But in the Chumash, it says this day is Pesach Shani, which means it's a second Pesach. It it has the. It's a holiday like the holiday of Pesach. But it's a different kind of tshuva, not the kind of tshuva that we approach in, in because we're broken and we're devastated and we're so upset. We're doing the tshuva comes out of the opposite, like this, the, the excitement of being able to be connected to Hashem. Here were people that missed out I'm bringing a carbon. And when Moshe Rabbeinu said, I'm giving you another chance, what it did to them was they preserved this day with great excitement. It wasn't a, a day of crying, it was a day of simcha. Because they had the opportunity to do the mitzvah again. And if you look at the Hayom Yom again, let me explain some of the words there. It says, 
even if it was tame, which means ritually impure, so we can interpret that literally, and the person was in contact with a dead body, or figuratively that they were impure in a spiritual sense, or somebody was far, we can interpret that literally, he was on a trip, on a road, far away from Jerusalem, or far, figuratively, far from Hashem, far from, from spirituality. And then it says, even if it was lachem, which means that the person was impure and they did it deliberately. So I would think, oh, they did it deliberately, they did it with intentionally, they shouldn't be able to make the change. So it says, no, even that person is being given the opportunity to be able to turn things around. Well, sorry, Rabbi, just, yeah. can you say that again? That even the person who does it deliberately gets the chance to turn it around. Yeah, even if the person missed that on the first place, that deliberately. Right, as in like defiance. That can and defiance and rebellious act. But if when the second place comes around, he feels different about it and wants to correct it, he's able to bring the crumb. We don't say, sorry, because you did deliberately, we're not giving you the second chance. Even that person has a second chance. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So even if I look at myself and say, well, my Sahara, I really knew that I was doing something wrong. I shouldn't have, I couldn't have. Doesn't matter. Hashem says that I want you to have, I want you to turn things around. So the, the, I think the real sort of um, the real key issue is to recognize, which is very different than the way most people view Hashem, like Hashem is an authority, a big a disciplinarian. He wants to make sure we do the right thing, and if you don't, he comes down crashing at you with a, with a, with a lightning, thunder and lightning. And the truth is, the opposite is true. Hashem is full of love and compassion, and he wants us to be able to connect to him, and he'll give us every opportunity possible that we can connect to him. The language that's written in the Chumash is sometimes a language that appears to be as if Hashem is angry, and he's taking revenge, and he's punishing us, that's because the Torah is written for everyone, and there are people that that's the only language they understand. But in general, if we have a, a true understanding of Hashem, it's the opposite. Hashem has love for every person, and Hashem wants us to turn around and, 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 and to change things. There's one more thing. I have another few minutes which I want to bring out. Another, another lesson we can learn from basic Shein. One of the ways that this is interpreted, one of the lessons we can learn from this is, there's a question. If you look at the words of these people, when they came to Moshe, they started off like this. They started off saying, we, are, if we were impure and we couldn't bring the carbon. And the Rebbe says, shouldn't they have started off with the positive first and saying, we want to bring a carbon. We're Jewish like everybody else. We want to be part of the Jewish nation and not be different than excluded. And we happen to have been impure. Why do they start off with saying we were impure? And Rebbe explains this is a very important lesson that we learn here. They were sort of saying the following. Look what Hashem did. He created a mitzvah that we're obligated to bring the carbon Pesach. But on the other hand, it's impossible that every single person should be able to bring that carbon. There are a few million people. Unfortunately, the way Hashem set up this world, someone is going to unfortunately pass away in, on one of those days and the family members will become impure and they won't be able to bring the carbon. So how does Hashem set up? It's almost like Hashem is doing something which is a paradox. He's telling us, I want everyone to bring this sacrifice. And then he sets up circumstances that doesn't allow us to do the sacrifice. And that's just the way the world is set up. And in fact, this sacrifice, no one else could bring it for me. I don't know if you're aware, but there are three categories of sacrifices. One is what's called a carbon yachid. Each individual brings it for something personal. A woman brought a sacrifice after she gave birth, or a man brought a sacrifice after he committed a sin, or if he was impure, it's a personal sacrifice. Then there are sacrifices which are communal. Like every morning they brought a sacrifice, but not everybody was involved. There were certain people that brought the sacrifice and they represented the whole Jewish nation. Carbon Pesach was the only different sacrifice. 
in the sense that every individual has to bring it, but all the Jewish people brought it, not just individuals. It, in the sense, had a combination of both. So in this case, you can't say, someone will bring it for me. I have to bring my own sacrifice. Yet Hashem puts the person in a position where he can because of, unfortunately, something, a tragedy happened. So why does Hashem do that? He creates a Torah, creates mitzvahs, and then creates circumstances that don't allow us to do it. And I guess it's a general question. Hashem created and says, I want the Jewish nation to be different. I want you to keep Shabbos. I want you to keep kosher. I want you to keep Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Pesach and other holidays. And you're different than other nations. You have to keep things differently. On the other hand, we're living in a world where you have to work and you have to earn money. And if you're keeping Shabbos and all these holidays, you have to spend much more money. And we don't have the time to do all the things we need to do because of just the way life is. So it looks again like as if Hashem is telling us, I want you to live a life which is different than the rest of the world, but I'm putting you into the same world as everybody else and you have the same life and the same requirements as everybody else for your survival. It seems like it's sort of a contradiction. So the fact that Hashem gave us Pesach Sheni was in a way Hashem saying, if you really want to make it work, you could make it work. It could work out. And so number one, it means that if I really care and I make the effort, I could make it work. Hashem enables it. It might look like it can't work out. It's like Shabbos. You know, there were people that came to America and they said to themselves, there's no way we can survive if we keep Shabbos. And unfortunately, many Jews who came to America as Shabbos observing Jews stopped keeping Shabbos. And because they felt it's impossible, you can't get a job. I once heard this from a Jew, and I heard it from him. He was in his mid-90s, and he came here in the early 1900s. And he came here as a young boy of 12 years old. His name was Mr. Lasker. Uh, he's the father-in-law of the famous Rabbi J.J. Hecht, in fact, the one that our school is connected to. And he said that he came as a boy of 12. He had to help his mother with supporting the family. He got a job in a factory, and then came Shabbos. So he didn't show up. When he came on Monday, he said, where were you? He said, I had a terrible headache. Okay. Next week goes by, come Shabbos, he doesn't show up. Where were you? Oh, I had a terrible stomach ache. Okay. The third week, he had another ache. Finally, the owner of the factory who was also Jewish says, I know why you're not coming. You're not coming because it's Shabbos. He wasn't Shabbos observant. If you can't come on Shabbos, then don't come on Monday. Goodbye. And he went from job to job to job. Not a joke. He said, wherever he went, it lasted a few weeks. When they realized he's not coming because of Shabbos, goodbye. Eventually, after many months, he came to a factory with this guy, really felt compassion for him. And he said, I will let you work in my factory on the condition that you come in on Sunday and work on the machines and catch up whatever you missed out. And he agreed. And he said, Friday afternoon, the other Jewish people who worked there would tease him. And they would say, L'chadaydi, L'chadaydi, when are you going home? L'chadaydi is the prayer we say Friday night. They would laugh at him. So when are you going home? When are you going home? But he said, that's how difficult it was in those days to get a job that you could be Shomer Shabbos. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but in America, when you want to say someone's very religious, they say he's Shomer Shabbos. What do you mean? There's a lot of myths. Why do they say Shomer Shabbos? Because in those days, in the early days in America, that was the key of people who kept Shabbos, even if they wanted to. There was a student in school that told me her grandmother came to America. She felt that she can't, she must work on Shabbos. And she went to work in Manhattan and walked every Shabbos two hours because she wouldn't want to ride. Okay, I have to work, but I don't have to ride. So she didn't ride. After a few months, she said, Listen, I'm being silly. I'm working anyway. I might as well get on the bus or the train or trolley car, whatever they had in those days. And that's how it went from one thing to the next to the next until they sort of dropped everything. And her granddaughter came back to it. So basically, you know, what they were saying is, if you make up your mind that this is what you want, Hashem created the world in a way that it could work out. It depends on your determination. And, and that's what we see. Uh, yes, Hashem created us in a way we keep you living in this world like everybody else, but yet we're connected to a higher presence that's higher than the limitations of this world. And therefore we're able to do both. We can do live a life as human beings in the physical world with everybody else and bring godliness into the world.
As the Nishto came from Fal. These are the three Yiddish words. There is no loss. There is no, never too late. That's the closest in English that we have. Okay, we're going to stop here. Go your matzah. I heard there's plenty of it in the dorm. What happened to girls that eat too much matzah? <laughs> I know there's a question, does the matzah that we eat today have the same spiritual power like the matzah we eat on Pesach? Probably not on the same level, but probably in a similar way. Just like that matzah strengthens our moon, our faith in Hashem. Matzah has a property to bring healing. So this matzah probably does the same in a smaller scale. Okay.